another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Verse 24, Paul asked this question, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your mercy and grace. I thank you for the way that you have moved around here. I thank you for Tuesday night service, the incredible spirit that was upon the house. I thank you for the anointing that I have felt here tonight. I thank you for everything that you've done this week and how you've blessed and that you've touched. I pray tonight that you would just sweep over this congregation. And God, that you would touch Sister Melissa, that you would move for her and heal her completely and totally. But God, tonight as we preach and as we listen, I pray, Father, that you'll give us unction in the pulpit and action in the pews. And we pray it in the name of Jesus. Somebody shout amen. You may be seated. I like preaching expositional sermons. I say expositional simply means verse by verse by verse. We spend, we spend a lot of time preaching about the Bible, but not necessarily preaching the Bible as the Lord gives it. The thing about preaching this way is you don't get to sidestep anything. You basically have to preach everything as it falls. Chapter 7, I've had to read it I don't know how many dozens of times. Maybe it came easy for most of you guys this week, but it took me a little bit of work. It's a powerful chapter. If you remember chapter 6, as we begin to study that, the Apostle Paul is talking a lot about sin. He's talking about freedom from sin. He's talking about the old man being crucified, the new man being alive, raised up in Jesus Christ. He's talking to us about not yielding our members as servants of unrighteousness, not yielding ourselves as uh, more or less slaves to the enemy and sin. And then we come into chapter 7, and he's going to make things a little bit more personal. And let's look at verses 1 through 3. He says, Know ye not, brethren, and he's talking to the church as a whole, he said, For I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man, as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Now that's a doozy there. <laughs> is there anybody out there? No? Is there anybody out there? Y'all trying to figure out what I'm going to do with them three verses, aren't you? That's what I was thinking. I've been trying to figure it out all week, too, in the middle of youth camp. And I've used these verses a lot of times. I've stood on both sides of the fence when it comes to divorce and remarriage. But what's happened to me as we begin to bring out these, these messages chapter by chapter it's forced me to take every verse in context. You know, a lot of times we'll take three verses like this out and couple it with five or six verses over there, three or four verses over here. And basically what you do is you create a doctrine. But as I begin to read Romans chapter 7, it becomes very clear that Romans chapter 7 has almost nothing to do with divorce and remarriage. It's, it's not about divorce and remarriage at all. He's, he's talking to us about living as slaves to the, law, to the law and as slaves to the flesh. But he's talking about us being freed from sin, all right? And so he uses the marriage analogy. He talks about us being married to the law and then being dead to the law and being married to Christ. Now, I'm not saying tonight that there are not some beautiful truths taught in these first three verses. They are. But these three verses do not offer the totality of God's teaching concerning divorce and remarriage. And so I'm going to hit that subject just briefly, and then we're going to move on to the point that's in context tonight. You know, we're living in a country where the divorce rate is actually declining, 
And the reason it's declining is because no one is getting married. I mean, so many people are just living in sin. They're living together. They won't get married. And what is happening is marriage isn't as sacred as it one time was. They basically thumb their nose that it's a lot easier to just live together and, and go through the motions than it is to commit. And it's really a shame, but it is just the way it is. And when we look at these three verses, we understand that God isn't playing around with marriage. It's a sacred union. It's something that He's very serious about. And I can take you to the Word of God and show you that the Bible actually says that God hates sin. Can somebody help me right here and pay attention, please? I'd appreciate it. So He actually hates divorce and remarriage and, and divorce itself. But you need to understand that He begins to appeal to the law. And, and He says to us, He says, you know, that how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. And he uses the law again. He's bound by the law. And he talks about the law. But the thing is, is when you go to the law in Deuteronomy chapter 24, for example, you'll find that there were particular issues and instances where they would allow divorce and remarriage. And so when you read these three verses, you have to remember that there's a lot more that the Bible says about divorce and remarriage. But at the same time, we also need to understand that when you say, I do, that it is God's intention for you to be, I do till death do us part. That is God's intention. Can somebody shout amen? We're living in a time that if you don't like something they do or, uh, you know, they have this what they call irreconcilable differences now. If you just can't get along, if you argue too much, if you fight a little bit, you just go down and you get a divorce. You know, God is not for that. And when you do that, you're putting yourself in a place where you're going to end up in an adulterous situation. And so when we start talking about divorce and remarriage, we have to take more verses than just these three, especially when you take in consideration that in context, the seventh chapter of Romans is not really about divorce and remarriage. But I will show you another chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 through 16, that will help maybe shed a little light on what Paul's saying. And he said, Unto the married uh, I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband, but and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And let not the husband put away his wife. But to the rest I speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath a husband that believeth not, if she be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Verse 15 says, But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Now, the, the spirit behind what Paul is saying is, is that as much as possible, as much as the power lies in you, that you should try to work peace inside your marriage. If you're married and your husband is lost, if you're married and your wife is lost, you don't get rid of her. That's not grounds for divorce. Just because they don't go to church with you, just because they don't pray with you, just because they may be even mean at times. I'm not talking about abusive. I'm not talking about uh, overbearing like that and being a dictator and hurting you. But when they just won't go to church and maybe they're grumpy and you don't like them, you can't just go down and get a divorce because because you don't like them. Paul is saying to you as a Christian spouse that if you're married to an unbeliever that you should try everything in your power to stay in that union because you might, your testimony, your life may convert them and bring them to the Lord Jesus Christ. But he says if they depart from you, there's nothing that you can do about that. And so you're not bound to the law of your husband. He can't just go out and do whatever he wants to and come back and expect you to just wait on him hand and foot. God never intended it to be that way. And we got, I'm going to go just a little bit further and I'm going to quit. But I want you to look at Matthew chapter 5 verses 31 and 32. Because the Bible only offers one grounds for divorce and remarriage. Just one. Verse 31, Jesus said, It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. And then you go to verse nine, uh, chapter 19, and he basically tells the same thing. He says in verse 7, They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement to put her away? He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, 
suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. In verse 9 he says, And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. In both cases, the Greek word that was translated fornication is the word porneo. And it simply means harlotry. And that takes in incest. That takes in homosexuality. It takes in every type of sexual promiscuous uh, action. And so basically what he says is, if you have any type of sexual relationship, it doesn't matter who it's with. It also means incest, another man, another woman. It means an animal, any kind of disgusting act that can be committed. He says if you step outside of that marriage covenant, he said that is the only possibility that you can divorce and remarriage. He says every other instance, I don't care what the excuse is, if you're remarried, he says you're setting yourself up for a situation that is adulterous. Now I know that's a little bit tight, but it's right here in front of us. He says saving for the cause of fornication or porneo, he says he causes that person that marries her to come in adultery and her also and now in the backdrop of all of this what we need to understand is the reason he's talking about divorce and remarriage is because over top of all of this he is saying that you all are married to the law you're married to legalism you're married to the pharisaic mentality that you have to work your way to heaven now i know that's strange and apostle paul does that a lot he'll use an, a natural analogy to use that to show us a spiritual truth but it's right here. And so now we're talking about divorce and remarriage as it is a spiritual context, all right? And so we move into verse 4. And he says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law. You remember he talked about being the husband dying, and now you're free to remarry. He says, But ye are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. In that Christ died, we are dead in Christ that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. And saints of God, that's difficult reading. I don't care who you are. When you open up that, I mean, yeah, you can read it a hundred times and maybe come to a conclusion and God can help you. But that is a difficult text right there. When he begins to talk about being dead to the law in verse 4, that was difficult for me until I realized that he wasn't necessarily talking about the commands itself. He was talking about the spirit of the law or that attitude that they had at that time that said, I have to work my way to heaven. And it wasn't only that I had to work my way to heaven. It was the idea that you could work your way to heaven. And so when we come into Romans chapter 7, God is saying that we should be divorced from that mentality, that we're not under that bondage anymore, but we are under the grace of God. We have come to the conclusion now that I have been yoked up with the spirit and an attitude that said as long as I'm crossing T's and dotting I's that I can go to heaven. It doesn't matter what my heart is like. It doesn't matter what my attitude is like. It doesn't matter what my disposition is like. As long as I think I can work my way to heaven, the grace of God is of none effect. But the facts of it are we are saved by grace and not by works, lest any man should boast. And if you're here tonight and you think that your good works is earning you merit with God, you are wrong, and I rebuke the devil tonight. Sit on me if you want to. Don't really care tonight. The Holy Ghost is in this house, and I'm telling you right now, you don't work your way to heaven. You go by and through the Lord Jesus Christ. You go by the door tonight. You've got to understand that you must be divorced to the spirit of legalism. And you come into verse 5, and he talks about the motions of sin. The motions of sin. And what he's talking about, the motions of sin, is the appetites or the desires that sin stirs up. Sin comes into your life, it wreaks havoc upon you. It doesn't just stop there. It'll cause you to want things that you never would have wanted. And when it comes into your life, it'll make you want more and more and more. And the appetite is never quenched. It is never filled. It is never satisfied. 
satisfied. And so the more you sin, the more you want to sin. And so he begins to talk about the motions of sin. And so sin whets the appetite for more. And it is a never-ending cycle. Sin causes there to be a gaping hole in your spirit. And it works like a cancer inside of it. And it eats away at the hole in your heart. And so in your mind you say, well, if I can go to church, I'll be all right. I can go and go and when go to the house of God a few times and I'll be all right. But God says, no, that is not what's going to fix it. You must come underneath the spout of the blood of Jesus and you must accept His mercy and His grace. And the reason that we see this is because when we come into verse 5, it, it makes it, He says, for when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. It almost sounds like the law caused them to sin. When you read that text, it reads as if, almost reads, sounds like the law was what caused them to sin. But it was not what caused them to sin. I want you to think about this right here. You take a rebellious heart. You take a rebellious teenager, rebellious adult. It doesn't matter what you tell them not to do. They're going to bend toward that. And so the law didn't cause them to sin. What the law did is expose their sin. And because their hearts were uh, wicked, because their hearts were ungodly, it caused them to want to bend toward that. It wasn't the law. The law in its beauty. The law in its power will cleanse the heart, will free the mind. But what Paul is saying was, when your heart is void of Jesus Christ, I can tell you not to do it, and that'll be the very thing that you want to do. That's what he's saying about the law. He's in the rebellious heart of the lost man is turned toward more sin. The law exposed what sin was. The wicked heart used that revelation to, for, as an occasion to sin more. It's amazing how we how this works out like that but it is just what it is and so we've got to be careful the unconverted heart is married to a works based religion and they feel like the more good works I do but you got to humble yourself down and you got to come to the place where you realize that no matter what I do no matter how much I say no matter how many times I go no matter what I do I am still void of the grace of God I've got to have him it is him in my life that will save me Somebody shout amen. And so he says in verse 6 that we have been delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held that we should serve in newness of the spirit and not in oldness of the letter. And so basically what he's saying is, is now we have a new guide. I've heard this over and over again. I've heard people tell me, say, well, when I was going to the church that made me live right, they, they made us, they dictated us, they put their thumb on top of us. I, I mean, it was easy for me to live right when they made us. They said, but now that I'm trying to serve God because I love Him and because I want to, it's hard. Saints of God, that's the only way you can serve God. If you're doing what you're doing because you have to, if you're doing what you're doing or not doing what you're not because I said it's wrong then you're in the wrong spirit but we've got a new God tonight I don't live for God because I have to I live for God because I want to I don't live a holy life because I have to I live a holy life because I want to because I'm in love with Jesus I don't go where I go I don't do what I do because God's got my arm twisted behind my back that is the old of the letter but God says we're serving him in the newness of the Spirit. I get up in the morning and do what I do because I'm in love with Jesus. We serve in the newness of Spirit. The law forces us to live right. Newness of Spirit, the grace of God provokes, provokes us to serve the Lord. We don't have to serve God. You, you can do whatever you want to. But some folks feel like they have to do. But you shouldn't have a have to attitude. It should be I want to. Dr. J. Vernon McGee tells a story of a handsome plantation owner who was married to a beautiful wife. Her husband died and she was so grieved. This is hard to fathom. Uh, she embalmed him and put him in a glass case sitting in a chair. Her friends and family knew that that couldn't be wholesome at all. So they convinced her that she needed to go on a vacation. So she went on a vacation for two years. And she met another man. She fell in love and they got married. And they came home and she forgot about old Billy. You know, in, in right there, she put him right there in the hallway, right there in the foyer. And when her, he, he had her in his arms and walked her across the threshold, and there was her dead husband. Amen. I mean, that's kind of crazy, isn't it? And he says to her, who's this? 
And she says, well, that was my first husband. He died. And the husband said, don't you think it's time to bury that husband? He goes, you got a new husband. And that's what I'm trying to tell you tonight. Some of you say to me, I'm not worthy. Of course you're not worthy. You never were worthy. And when you start talking about not being worthy, I can't do it in myself. Basically what you're saying is, I'm married to a works-based religion. In my mind, i got to do this and i got to do that. What you need to do tonight is come on down to Jesus. And you need to bury the old husband and understand that I can do nothing in myself. The only way that I can go to heaven is through and by the blood, through and by the grace, through and by the mercy. If you could have done it in your own power, Jesus would have stayed in heaven. But he knew you needed God. So God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Amen. I don't know if the story is true or not. But it illustrates an important truth for you and I tonight. Many Christians have not buried the idea that living good and saints of God, we've been preaching for weeks on living right for God, but at the end of the day, all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. All I've sinned, I've sinned. Oh God, have mercy on me. I've not done everything right, neither have you, but yet we still find ourselves at the feet of Jesus. So stop trying to earn His love. Live the best you can. Live as holy as you can but at the end of the day lay prostrate before God and say I already buried the old man I am married to the grace of God let's move on verse 7 what shall we say then is the law sin God forbid nay I had not known sin but by the law for I had not known lust except the law has said thou shalt not covet but sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concup- uh, co- concupiscence. Amen. I about spoken tongues there. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. I like what he said in verse 7, I had not known sin, but by the law. The thing that you and I need to understand tonight is that the law of God is a beautiful thing. It doesn't feel good, but the law of God has to be preached. The law of God has got to be taught. We must preach thou shalt not because I don't want to go to hell. I need to know what I'm doing. It is never a good thing to have your faults opened up. And that happens to me all the time. God lays me bare. But He doesn't use the Koran. He uses the Holy Word of God. I don't always like it. I would like to think that I walk above sin. But every now and then, He opens up the book and He says, Lamb, this is what you are and you are wrong. And I find myself again at the altar saying, Oh Lord, it hurts. But it was because of the law that I now know what it is to sin, what it is to live righteous. Don't you get mad at me when I preach against sin. You ought to throw your hands up and say, oh, it hurts, but I'm glad the man of God has got the mirror in the house tonight. Oh, feel like preacher. I may not like it, but I want you to let me have it anyway. He says in verse 8, but sin taking occasion by the commandment. And we see it again. He's reemphasizing again the, 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 the law, the commands of God. They step up in my face. What kind of heart do you have tonight? Does your heart want to lean toward that sin? Does your heart want to lean toward it? Or when you see it, do you want to lean away? Because if you're really born again tonight, like you, like you claim that we are tonight, when we're, when the sin is revealed to us, we ought to turn toward God as hard as we can. We ought to say, God, God, as hard as I've tried, I find myself falling again. But I don't want to ever do it again. I'm turning from that to you. I've got to have your help. He said, sin, taking occasion by the commandment, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me, wrought in me, all manner of concupiscence. That word is, means desire for the forbidden. The knowledge of sin made the rebellious heart want sin. They made it want the unknown. 
It wanted that which was dangerous. Have you ever met a woman who seems like all she wants is a bad boy? She can't, she can't handle a real good man and a treat her right and be nice to her. She gotta have somebody that'll cuss her out. Have to have somebody that's running around beating on her. Saints of God, a lot of us are like that. We want that which is forbidden. We want that which has been, uh, uh, we've been told you can't touch that. You can't eat of that tree right there. And so now our hearts are inclined to lean toward that. But saints of God, God is wanting us to understand that we can live right, but it's going to be in His power. It's going to be in His strength. You've got to be careful tonight. The man of God, he's, he's writing to us and he's telling us that the rebellious heart hates rules and the word of God, the law is rules. And so that heart bends against it. But the righteous heart, the born again heart, even when sin is exposed in his life or her life, as she is grieved and she is hurt now, the heart is softened. You shouldn't go in rebellion and run from God. If you've got sin in your life tonight, you need to come to God. You need to confess your faults and let God heal you and feel you and let God save you and deliver you tonight. The law arouses man's rebellious nature. It makes him want to do that which is forbidden. The forbidden becomes the things to do list. Flagship hotel in Houston, Texas is built right next to the water. Large plate glass windows adorn the dining room on the bottom floor. I mean, it's right on the water. And what happens is the people on the second third and fourth floors want to go fishing and you got to have real heavy heavy uh, uh, flo- uh, 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 sinkers and so sometimes they don't have their, their, their line out far enough and it swings out and it swings in and it was cracking the window of that first floor diner but what happened was is there was signs everywhere that said no fishing, no fishing and for whatever reason it was that was what provoked them they said no fishing, watch this now that motel, the, the way that they solved that, they took down all the signs and folks quit fishing because man's nature is to turn against God. But that's why I had to be born again. That's why you've got to become a new creature in Christ Jesus. So if you tell me you can't stop sinning, I tell you that you're not born again. You're still living like the old man in the flesh and as a man of the old spirit, but you need to be washed and filled and revived. Amen. And then he says this, I've been made alive, once alive, without the law. Alive without the law. Now this could mean a few things. Some believe that he's referring back to Adam before the law. He was saying humanity before the fall was alive without, you know, without that. And, and the word of God, that the law itself had not been created. And so what happens basically here is he is saying there was a time in my life that I thought that it was acceptable to live in sin because I didn't have the knowledge of the law. The saints of God, God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and Sodom and Gomorrah didn't have a Bible. God destroyed the earth in Noah's day and they didn't have a Bible. But God has written the Word of God upon our hearts and in our conscience. I don't care where you go. The darkest tribe in Africa, they know what it is when when they murder. They know it's wrong when they steal because God has placed it in their heart and they know that they must be delivered from that. And so He says there was a time that I thought it was acceptable to live in sin because I didn't have the knowledge of the law. And then we come into verse 9 and 10 and, and, he, and he's talking to us and he says, And the commandment which was ordained to life, he said, I found to be unto death. So he's reemphasizing the nature of a rebellious heart to turn against the law. And so basically what we understand now is that the law is a schoolmaster. It reveals the sins of our heart. It doesn't save us. The law doesn't have the power to pull you out of the sin. 
know what it is? It becomes a mirror. You need to read the Bible because it's a mirror. The Bible tells us it's not a telescope. It's not a magnifying glass. But if you throw it up just right, you'll be able to see who you are. It shows the sinful heart who it is. And it also lets him stand at a crossroad and choose what will I do. And most of the time, they're going to do what's wrong. Has anybody ever found themselves in that dilemma? They wanted to do right, but they could not. It's because you've got to be born again tonight. You've got to have Jesus Christ in your life. And in verse 11, he says, For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good. That sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Again, he's reemphasizing. Look at verse 11. He says, sin taking occasion by the commandment, Taking occasion because the word said, don't do it. The rebellious heart said, all right, I'm going to do it anyway. Said it deceived me. And because I chose sin, it slew me. It worked death. How many knows that sin works death in your life? Sin may seem like there's some pleasure in it for a season but at the end of the night when the music fades and the boy, the girl is gone and the buzz comes is, is going down, the high is going down and you're coming back to your senses and you realize that you've done things that you cannot take back and you say oh my God, the party is over and I have I've done shameful things. I have destroyed my life. It is there that you realize that sin isn't all that it's cracked up to be. And some of you are there right now. What is the answer? The answer is Jesus. 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 The flesh influenced by the power of sin and its rebellion toward the law deceived him. He's now spiritually dead. And he stops. He wants to make sure that we get a perfect and clear understanding of Paul's understanding of the law. And he says to us that the law is holy. He says in verse 12, the law is just. He says the law is good. So don't you think tonight that the law is bad? Yeah, oh, no, 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 no. We don't live by the old law, they say. Well, then you're going to go to hell because the law said thou shalt not steal. The law said thou shalt not kill. The law shall, said thou shalt not commit adultery. The law said thou serve the Lord thy God and Him only. Have no other gods before Him. If you don't live by the law, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. But it's what spirit do you live the Word of God? And so now we're looking at the Word of God. The law of God is holy. Some Somebody shout holy. The law of God is just. The law of God is good. In Psalms 19 and 8, the psalmist said, The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. I need the law of God. And you say, well, what about Jesus? The one that came by grace. That's right. He said, I came not to destroy the law, but I came to fulfill the law. I didn't come to do away with it. I come to be the lamb that was slain. I come to be that propitiation. I come to be that atonement. I come to fulfill the law of God. Verse 13. He says, what then was then uh, that which was good and made death unto me? God forbid, but sin, that it might, might appear sin, working death in me. Death, sin works death. And he says, by that which is good, the law is good, but it exposes the sin in my life. That sin brings death. That sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. One of our problems is sin doesn't it look exceedingly sinful to us. One of the reasons that folks can't serve the Lord in all their heart is because they still look at the world and the things of the world with a twinkle in their eye. They haven't really got it yet. There's a lot of folks that fear sin, but you've got to get to the place that you hate sin. You've got to get to the place where you don't just shun sin because you're afraid of it. 
you got to get to the place where you hate it because you know it robs you of the glory. It robs you of God's favor. you got to get to a place where when the enemy comes in and starts tempting you, you say, I don't think so. Not that I can't sin against my brother, but I cannot sin against my God. I cannot sin against Him that is high and holy. I love Him. I cherish Him. I covet Him. I hate sin. That's why I don't do the things that I don't. He's trying to end, He's trying to impress upon our minds that sin needs to be looked upon like a rattlesnake. Sin needs to be looked upon as a cesspool, filthy and nasty and rotten. It may seem pleasurable. The fornication, the adultery, whatever it is, the high, the, the alcohol, the drugs. It may seem pleasurable. It may seem like an escape. But God says, I want you to have the proper perspective about sin. Instead of looking at gossip as a funny thing, you need to start understanding that gossip is exceedingly sinful. These things are wicked. It's amazing to me that when he goes to describe the thing that he died to save us from, the absolute best description that God can give us about sin is that it is exceedingly sinful. And so that is what we've got to see tonight. When you leave here tonight and the enemy tempts you to sin, I want you to start looking at your heart. Why is it that I don't do that? Why is it that I avoid that? Why is it that I won't go there? Is it because you hate it or simply because you fear it? Either way, you need to turn from it, but you need to get your heart to a place that you hate sin. Verse 13, was them that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, it worked in me death. And he said the sin by the commandment might become exceeding simple. you got to get that. Now, I want to move into my last point here. I'm preaching tonight on I need a hero. I need a hero. I need a hero. These verses right here that I'm getting ready to read you, these eight or nine verses, are some of the most highly debated verses in Christendom. There's debates going on right now all across the country on what these verses mean. So let's read them and let's talk about them. Verse 14, Paul says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will or the want to is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would do, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. He says in verse 21, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. And so the Apostle Paul begins to deal with the war that is going on between his flesh and his spirit. And to summarize all of those verses, he says there's a part of me that wants to do right, but there's a part of me that wants to do wrong. He says there's a part of me that wants to live right, and I try to do this but there's another part of me that makes me do that and so the things that I don't want to do I do them and the things that I do I didn't want to do them and so he's got this conundrum here and there's a lot of folks who say well right there I'm telling you that's the reason you can't live above sin because Paul was sinful but I want you to consider the fact that I just preached on Romans chapter 6 the same man that wrote this chapter wrote verses like this what shall we say then Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Or how about verses 
6 and 7 where he said knowing this that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin for he that is dead is freed from sin the same man wrote that and now he comes over to chapter 7 I would like to present to you the idea that Paul is not necessarily talking about the struggle that is overcoming him but he's talking about the capacity that every man and woman in this house has because you can go to Galatians 5.17 and Paul told them that there was a war going on between his flesh and the spirit he says the war is in their carnal you know their enemies against each other the flesh lusted against the spirit the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you want there is a war going on inside of every person in this house there is a struggle there is the born again child of God that wants to do the right thing that wants to love God that wants to live for God but there is an old bunch of skeletons the old man that you buried a long time ago and he wants to stick his head up but oh you gotta keep your heart anchored in Jesus you gotta keep that man crucified have you ever felt that cross pull have you ever felt that desire to pray more that desire to fast that desire to read the word of God more and you did it for about two days and then on the third day you got up and you didn't keep what you said you were going to do most of the people in this room have made a vow at one time to God I'm going to pray X amount of time you see it doesn't matter you you can have whatever attitude you want you can be a help to the church you can be a hindrance to the church if you're a spiritual man a spiritual woman you'll help the church if you're a carnal man you'll try to put the brakes on the church it's the same thing inside our hearts if you're a spiritual man you'll be able to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh but when you quit feeding the spirit when you quit reading the word when you quit carrying your cross daily you're going to find it very hard to pray very hard to fast very hard to go to church very hard to worship very hard to live for God very difficult and so there is a war there is a cross pull I have a desire to do right but if I let the flesh it will overcome that desire and I will do wrong has anybody ever been there verse 24 as I close tonight Paul says oh wretched man that I am oh wretched man he doesn't say how holy man I am he doesn't say how glorious I look at me I'm the greatest person that ever lived I can do all things no 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 he said oh wretched man that I am he says this who shall deliver me from this body of death you know what Paul's saying he's saying I need a hero I need somebody that can leap over walls and buildings and can come into my situation and help me, deliver me, and save me out of this situation. Who, who shall deliver me? To the body of this death. Now he's referring to a Roman. He's referring to a form of Roman execution. Verse 24. He's referring to a form of Roman capital punishment. They would take a living convict, a murderer, first degree murder. A man of, uh, of wicked character man had done violent things and they would take a dead body and they would put them forehead to forehead and take a an iron band and fasten them together forehead to forehead and they would take that living convict and fasten him hand to hand both hands with a metal band and feet to feet and so it didn't matter where this man went he carried a dead carcass with him and so if he walked down the street he would have to walk obviously he didn't go anywhere but there was no way to unfasten that dead body and what would happen more times than not is before before the convict would die 
the decaying flesh of that corpse would begin to eat away at his face and that man would go insane and Paul says when you're living in the flesh when you're living in sin you're like a man that is attached to a dead body oh you think that you're free you think that you're liberated but you're not he says who shall deliver me from this body of death I read this right here today I couldn't help but laugh Old man was asleep, and some of his buddies took some Limburger cheese and smushed it into his mustache. And he got up, and he said, Whoa, this bedroom stinks. And he went out in the hallway. He said, Great day. This hallway stinks. And he went into the kitchen. He said, My. This kitchen stinks. He went into the living room. He said, whoa, this living room stinks. He walked out on the porch. And he said, honey, the world, it stinks. And I know folks like that. They think the church stinks. They think the people stink. They think all the folks stink. When the truth is, it isn't the kitchen. It isn't the hallway. It isn't the living room. It's your upper lip. Somebody shout amen. Oh yeah, I meet people all the time. It's a conspiracy. Nobody likes me. Nobody will be my friend. Everybody hates me. It isn't everybody. It's you. It's me. We've got to go to God and let Him crucify us. Sister Taylor, would you come? Who shall deliver me from the Limburger cheese? Yeah. Who's going to deliver me? Everything doesn't smell. Every, everybody in this church is not bad. No, 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 no. no. Not everybody in your life is wrong. Some of us need to go to the mirror and say, oh, you the man. You the problem. Quit trying to blame it on everybody else, Brother Stevie. You the man. You the man that got the Limburger cheese right there. I see it. You see mine? I got some right there. And that's a problem tonight. Always trying to figure out. Oh, come on, saints of God. Paul is there. He's telling us he's there. But he says, I've got news for you. He shouts it into the roof from the rooftop. He says, is there deliverance? Is there anybody that can save me? Is there anybody that can help me? I had a woman. I was in Florida pastoring. And she came over to our church. And she didn't like our church. Went to another church. Didn't like that church. And she calls me up. And she says, Pastor, I don't know where to go. This church is bad. That church is bad. I think I'm going to go to Kentucky. I said, it's not going to do you any good. You can't run from the problem when you are the problem. You can't hide from the problem when you are the problem. I had an old man, old woman in Florida sat down with me. And they said, I've been, I know I've been to seven churches in three years. They said, I promise, Pastor, it's all the church. Church's fault. And they had forgotten that one of those seven churches was mine. The one they were sitting in. And I said, well, I remember two years ago, you were coming here and you left. And why did you leave? And then she backed up and she said, oh no, there's nothing wrong with the church. God was just leading us. No, 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 no. It was them. It wasn't every church they ever went to. There comes a point, brothers and sisters, that you need to stand up and say, who shall deliver me? Not who shall deliver Tom. Not who shall deliver Justin. Who shall deliver me? I want victory. I want power. I want anointing. I want a consistent walk with God. My problem isn't even the devil. My problem is the man in this skin right here. If this church rises, it's going to rise on Jesus Christ. That will require this house to be humbled. It's going to require me to say, woe is me. I have failed. And then I must correct my failures. And the only way to correct a failure, really, truly, is to bring it to Jesus and cast it on Him. Man, this is so powerful. 
This is so powerful. Paul's desperate. He says, I've tried everything. He says, but I need a hero. And some of you tonight are in desperate need of someone that can pull you up out. In verse 25, he gives us an answer. He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I would myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. This is what I'm telling you. That in ourselves, there is no victory. In ourselves, there is no revival. In yourself, you are going to destroy your home. You're going to destroy your life. You're going to destroy your family. You're going to destroy your mama, your daddy. You're going to destroy your children. You're going to destroy everything. In ourselves, we're going to destroy this church. When it becomes our church, when it becomes our ministry, when, when we start saying, I built it, I did it, now Jesus Christ is no longer getting the glory. And God is going to extract His glory off of the house because God doesn't share His glory. And so we as a church have got to come to the point where we understand that the only thing we've done is grieve God. The only thing we've done is hurt God. But we as a group, you as a father, you as a mother, Mother, you as a sister, you as a husband, whoever you are, you and I, I as a pastor, I can rise up I as, a, as a husband. I can rise up when I see my children and I know that i got to do better. I know that I don't have to do it in myself. I can say, who shall deliver me? And then I can echo the words of eternity. I thank God through Jesus Christ. You can have victory, but it's going to be in the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ, stand me across the house, everyone at will. How have I ended up in this condition? We always end up in this condition. You know, it's why it's so dangerous to text when you're driving. It's also very dangerous to look out your rearview mirror the whole time you're trying to drive or look over your shoulder. What happens when you begin to look a certain left to right? You start gravitating that direction. You start gravitating that direction. We have to get our eyes on Christ tonight. It isn't in this house. It isn't in this house. It's in Jesus Christ. You want victory? Some of you right now. Your whole life. You've tried to serve Him. You did good for a while. You fail. You walked in the Spirit for a while, you fell. And some of us in the house, it's been just a, a never-ending thing. Over and over and over and over and over and over. You need to do like Paul did. And you need to say, who's going to deliver me from me? Who's going to save me from myself? The law of God is going to show you who you are and what you are and where you stand with God. And then you need to cry, oh God, save me from me. Somebody needs to say it tonight, save me from me. Save me from me. We're always blaming each other, but we need to save me from me. Because if I have peace with God, if I have the peace of God, it doesn't matter what goes on around me. But this also lets me know that no matter how far you've fallen, Jesus can pick you up. It doesn't matter how deep that you've been in the chains of sin, Jesus Christ can shake those chains free. Let's pray. Father, we come to you. In the name of Jesus, a sober message tonight really should be a dancing message. Because no matter where we're at, no matter how inconsistent our life has been, you haven't left us alone. You've made the provision. You've made the path to freedom. The path to freedom is not 